last uh, room I taught in had a blackboard. Uh, I'm Tim Dupani. I am currently the physics department at John H. Reagan High School um, in Houston, Texas. Uh, John H. Reagan, as I'm sure a few of you know, was Postmaster General, General of the Confederacy. So while the country was being torn apart, John H. Reagan made sure the mail got delivered. Uh, but I didn't always teach physics. Uh, when I first came in the district, I taught what was called physical science. It was also known by the administration as sweat hog science. Um, and the students I taught were known as the repeat offenders for a couple of reasons. One reason was between them and their parole officer. And the other reason is they were taking the course for the second, third time, fourth time, because they needed the credit. And I'm a first year teacher, I'm new, I'm young, I'm short and skinny, well, I still am. Um, and so I asked the principal, how do you teach these students? Give me some advice. And he said, well, when a fight breaks out in your classroom, make sure you call for backup. Don't try to break it up by yourself. Now that's not exactly what they teach you in Education 101, so I went to the department chairman and I said, well, give me some advice here. And he said, well, here's the curriculum, here's how you teach it, here's how it was taught last year. Now, these were students who failed the course last year, and we're going to do the same thing this year, and we're going to expect different results. I didn't think that was really practical, so I looked at the curriculum. The curriculum was written for the college prep students. Most of my students were vocational students. They wanted to be craftsmen in a number of fields. The school offered all sorts of vocational programs, everything from cosmetology to bricklaying. Um, and it wasn't written for my students. It was the college prep students. How do we get these students to actually learn? Um, well, what we did was, there was, first of all, no connection with the curriculum to my students, none at all. Uh, you take something such as thermodynamics. We had to teach thermodynamics. How we went about teaching it was pretty much, much up to me. Um, thermodynamics, one of the things that they do in thermodynamics is specific heat. Specific heat, you take a sample of metal, brass, lead, aluminum, you find uh, how quickly it heats up, how quickly it cools down. That's not going to have any connection with the repeat offender. So instead of looking at the specific heat of a hunk of brass, we looked at the specific heat of antifreeze. Why do you put 50% water, 50% antifreeze. Why not 75%? These are questions that related to my students. Um, if you think about it, a car's engine is a perfect laboratory for thermodynamics. So we spend a lot of time with cars, with auto shop, trying to make a connection between what the students already knew, and they knew quite a bit, to what they had to know. Most of them applied the laws of thermodynamics every day, but they couldn't actually articulate that. So we looked at that. Um, a car's radiator, why is a car's radiator black? Well, it has to do with black body radiation. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with the specifics of that, but it explains why a car's radiator is black. Um, what we're trying to do here is validate their life experiences with and give that some sort of credibility to the science curriculum. Uh, we're trying to build on what they already know, use that as a foundation. These students were very intelligent, but they were repeating the course as many times as it took to get that science credit. They only need two science credits, and this was one of them. Well, I thought I did such a great job. The principal called me in the last day, and I thought, all right, you know, I'm going to move up in the world like George Jefferson. Now, sorry, he said, you were so good teaching the repeat offenders, you're going to get them next year and for the rest of your life. I'm like, oh man, okay, you know, I need the job. Uh, I had a cat, you know, that I was supporting, <laughs> and the cat was big. So, uh, next year I had the repeat offenders again, but they, were not, they weren't repeat offenders from my class, they were repeat offenders from someone else's class. And it was a really easy class to teach. I would have the auto mechanics 
So it teaches all about auto mechanics, it teaches about force, what actually happens inside the car's engine. The electricians taught us how to wire a house. Some of my students who were repeat offenders in another sense of the word, taught us how to hot wire a car. That experience comes invaluable. Well, all good things don't last forever, sorry about that, because of administrative transfers um, of myself and others throughout the district. I was told I was going to be teaching physics, and I was told the day before school started. So I did what any conscientious teacher did, I panicked. <laughs> My God, you know, I'm going to teach a college prep course. I never even took a college prep course in high school, ever, uh, amazingly enough. Um, so what do you do? Well, I contacted some of the physics teachers in the district. How do you teach physics? Well, they said it's really easy. Just lecture, just like you did in college. Well, where I went to college, the professor who taught theoretical physics would turn around and he would write the formulas on the board with his right hand and he would erase with his left hand. And if you asked a question, you would, he would spend the rest of the time humiliating you in class while he was writing the formulas and erasing with his left hand. Now that's not going to work for me because I'm left-handed, so I'd have to write in Hebrew or something like that. It just wasn't going to do it. So what do you do? Well, I thought about my experience in college. First of all, in my college, it was a typical comprehensive university uh, in the country. Only about 10, 15% of all the students there were in some sort of higher level science course. And there were very few Americans in the higher level science courses. And there were even fewer women. And I had to ask myself, why? Well, if you ask anyone in college, you know, why aren't you taking physics? Why aren't you taking the higher level science? They'll tell you something like, science is hard, or I'm not good at science, or girls don't do science, or some nonsense like that. And these experiences, or these excuses, could probably be traced back to a negative experience that they had probably in high school. What we were doing in high school is we were teaching for that small percentage, maybe 10, 15 percent of the students who were going to go on, who knew that they were going to go on uh, to college and major in some sort of science. The other 85 percent of the students we didn't care about. Uh, my department chairman said, well, you know, they shouldn't be in science. <clears throat> well, I'm sorry, but I don't think Limiting a child's career options at 15 or 16 years old is practical. I mean, most of us, what we thought we would be doing when we were 15 is not what we were going to be doing today. I mean, when I was 16, I wanted to play left field for the Philadelphia Phillies, and the only thing that stopped me from doing that was a complete lack of talent. So, <laughs> you know, your experience changes. What the physics students, who are all college prep, they weren't any brighter than the repeat offenders. Their motivation was maybe different. Their focus was a little different. But what they wanted to know was what works and why. So we looked at the specific heat of antifreeze. They wanted to know that. That was something that they had never done before. The problem was I didn't have my car mechanics to teach this class. I had to actually teach the whole thing. And if you think about it, Physics explains how everything in the world works. It really does, except for the sixth game of the 1986 World Series and the continuing popularity of Barry Manilow. I, I just haven't figured any of those out yet. Um, I joke that physics is three laws of motion, and after that, it's details. Well, if you go back to Galileo, and Galileo, probably one of the most brilliant scientists who ever lived, Galileo figured out that the big rock and the little rock, if you drop them both from the same height at the same time, boom, they both hit the ground at the same time. But Galileo couldn't explain why. Okay, Galileo, why? That's where Galileo hits the brick wall. Galileo couldn't understand why. And we were expecting our students to understand a fairly abstract concept like gravity in a week when it took Galileo, which that eluded Galileo for the rest of his life. He couldn't figure out why. So what we're trying to do is make the class a lot more concrete, a lot more concrete for our students, because they're still high school students. What we wanted to do was create a high school class for high school students. 
The typical lab for acceleration due to gravity, uh, it's great, it's boring as anything. Uh, has the student roll a marble off their desk, they time how long it takes the marble to fall from their desk to the ground. And that's it. Well, Galileo discovered that if you have the acceleration due to gravity, you can measure how tall a building is. Well, you have to do that lab, but we don't do that lab. What we do is we drop watermelons off a three-story building. And we also clean it up because I really like my janitors, and there's one person you want to keep happy at your school is your janitors. Um, this demonstrates the acceleration due to gravity, plus the students are going to remember this for the rest of their life. They're not going to remember a marble coming off the desk. What they're going to remember is the time they were throwing the watermelons off the roof. Most colleges and universities will teach science their way. What I wanted to do was give my students a solid foundation. So if they choose to go into science, they'll be able to do that. If they want to be French literature majors, fine, but they will have had a solid foundation in physics. Um, well, one thing about science is that it can be replicated from one area to the next. And uh, as Ms. McIntyre said, I was a Fulbright scholar. It was great. I got to travel at government expense. I also got to travel at government expense when I was in the Army, but this is a lot, a lot more fun, I'll tell you that. <laughs> in India, the instruction is based on rote memorization. The students have to do well on the Central Board of Secondary Education exam. If they don't do that, do well there, the few, their future options are fairly limited. Um, so I asked the principal of the school that I was teaching. I was teaching in uh, one of the largest school systems in uh, the country. Uh, don't go, I get better. <laughs> I'm Bertie Simmons' opening act. Um, <laughs> So I asked the principal, well, how do you teach? You know, how do you teach physics? And he said, oh, we just want you to lecture. Where have I heard that before? If I went to my students in India, they could give me every formula in the world for gravity. But, uh, they could say, yeah, distance equals one half gt squared, which was great. And then you say, okay, explain to me why the big rock and the little rock hit the ground at the same time. They had never done that. They couldn't explain it. So what we ended up doing is we ended up dropping rocks from the balcony. And I was also doing some magic tricks in class. Uh, in India, the teachers never questioned. And it's a very formal, very rigid um, environment. And I was coming in as an American. Well, on the exams the students had to take, you had to have, if the teacher had 60% passing, that's great. That's 40% failure. Um, now, that's not good. Um, the principal took me aside, saw what I was doing, and he said, no, no, no jokes, no magic tricks. Teach to the test. And I said, okay, fine, yeah, sure. Got you covered, guy. Um, or words to that effect. And I just kept on quietly doing the magic tricks. Well, the day of the test came up. Now, if all my students failed, uh, you know, I was still going to go back to the States, uh, but if all the students failed, he was going to be going to Kashmir. He didn't like want that. What happened is my students, for the first time in their life, they actually understood physics, and they had a 95% passing rate. When I was teaching physics in uh, Houston School District, students finally understood physics because we had a practical applications-based course. Um, same thing with the repeat offenders, where they understand it because they're actually doing it. Uh, the only people who have ever really opposed it was the department chairman because they said it's not the way to teach, it's not tradition. Well, you know, when people tell you it's the traditional way or it's not tradition, it used to be defended that it's the tradition, um, women couldn't vote. Well. I spent a significant part of my life in Philadelphia. Dead men voted in Philadelphia before women did. Now dead men and women can vote, vote in Philadelphia. All right? 
Now, I don't know what the answers are. I don't even know what the question is. But I do know that by bringing the students in, um, validating what they know, making them active participants in their own learning, can increase science education, our scores in science education. Fewer Americans are actually taking science. Um, fewer Americans are actually majoring in science. A lot of the innovations in science are coming from other countries. And um, that's, not, that's not good. What we're doing is we're using the same methodology, same equipment that we're being used in the Truman administration. Uh, the thing is, the teacher has to be imaginative enough to create lessons that actually bring the students in. Um, and that has to come with administrative support. Um, you know, I don't know what the answers are. And I, I wish I did. If I did, I'd be making a lot more money than I do now. But I know it can be done. It's been done here in the Houston School District. The only thing I can talk about is the success that we've had doing a practical application-based course. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, we fail. But I know that at least we're moving forward, and sometimes if I fall flat on my face, I'm going in the right direction. Uh, I just want to close, um, I see the time here. Um, one of the advantages of teaching in Houston is that we have a very diverse uh, population here. In Reagan High School, we have over 2,000 students. We have students from all over the world. And one year, I had a student um, who came from a country where dog was on the menu. Uh, now, I don't know about you. I've never had dog. And every time I watch PBS, Julia Child never cooked dog. Um, so I asked the student, I said, well, what's it taste like? And he told me it tastes like chicken. So I said, OK. I said, I guess it, yeah, serve dog, serve a nice Chardonnay or something. Then I said, well, is it any good? And he looked at me and said, well, it depends how you cook it. In a way, science education is, to me, is kind of like cooking dog. Is it any good? Well, it depends how you cook it and it depends how you teach it. Thank you very much.